Today, I want to go ahead and welcome Dan. You can go ahead and make your way up, Dan. And uh, those of you, many of you know Dan already. Dan is a friend of New Life Church, was a member here for years as they uh, served here in the capital city and uh, were a part of this church. And now they're on the mission field. We support them on a regular basis. It's great to have you guys joining us. And uh, you may or may not know this, uh, but I guess they join us on a pretty regular basis online. So good to have you with us here in person today. Why don't we welcome him today? Amen. Hallelujah. What a fun 9.30 service. You weren't there, though. Boy, I pray for my voice. <laughs> we really had a good time, man. Did I enjoy that? It is great to be back with family because Kathy and I really consider you our family. No matter where we are in the world, and we've lived in the States, we actually, Kathy and I are both originally from the Twin Cities. Oh, that, by the way, I don't finish by 10, 1025 anymore now, do I? What time do I finish by now? 11.55. Okay, it's our secret. It's our secret, 11.55. All right, but it's great to be with family. And, you know, Kathy and I grew are from the Twin Cities originally. We had our kids there, lived in South Dakota for 10 years, then moved to Missouri for seven years. And from there, the Lord began to really expand our horizons. And we did a lot of traveling for about seven years all around the U.S., ministering wherever the Lord opened a door. And God is faithful. I was talking with Janelle just uh, between the services, Janelle Scott. They're just talking about the faithfulness of God. I'll tell you, if you are concerned about saying yes and being totally sold out for Jesus, I know that there are people here, young people, old people, you've got a call of God in your life to do something that's beyond what you can even imagine or ask or think. And God's saying, just yes. Just say yes. Just trust me. And I know our American Western Civ personality temperament is to say, I'll say yes when I know what the question is. And Jesus is calling you to say yes before he tells you what the question is. Or before he gives you direction to give you an unreserved yes in your heart to simply say, God, I don't know what you have for me, but I know whatever it is, it's good because I know you are good and faithful and loving no matter what my circumstances are. And so, God, I'm just going to throw myself to the Holy Spirit wind because you can trust the Holy Spirit and let him take you. Early, we were in uh, Ireland and Scotland, uh, the other, I think it was just last year, we've been there a couple of times ministering, and I was inspired by these missionaries on the island of Iona, a little tiny windswept island, three miles by one mile. They would put a missionary in a boat, and they would send them off. And wherever God took them, that's where they would bring the gospel. And that's how Northern Europe was saved uh, from, from that period of time in the, uh, you know, when, when there were, you know, just a bunch of pagan people that lived in Northern Europe. It was the Irish that God used in boats with just trusting God to lead them. So you can trust the one who died for you. If you're holding back, don't hold back anymore. We are living in exciting days, and, I, and I'm tired of talking about the, uh, the virus word, and that's about as much credit as I'll give it as just saying the virus, all right? I'm tired of talking about it because people have used the last 12 months to, to hold back. They've been using it as an excuse to, to not move further with God or not go to church and not see what God has for them. And I want to challenge you. These are exciting times. What the devil has intended for evil regarding this virus, God is using it for good all around the world. Amen? Amen. We are seeing it wherever we go. People are hungrier for God now in the last 12 months, certainly in the last six months we've noticed, in Europe where we live in eastern Germany and in the last five weeks that we've been back in the States. There is a greater ease, Kathy and I are finding, in sharing the gospel with people. People are hungry. They're more interested in hearing what you have to say because people are hungry and desperate for truth. Amen. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20. Oh, by the way, Mr. Tech Man, I told you. Do you have that ready? Our YouTube page? Come on, where is it? We have a missionary, we have a YouTube channel called Missionary Adventures. Do you actually have the, the page here? Ah, you couldn't do it. Okay. If you got our newsletter, you'll see it on the bottom there on the back on our newsletter. We encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, not because it's going to go viral someday. 
of which it will go viral someday. But um, it's really cool how the Lord has kind of directed us into doing YouTube videos from around the world, usually about three-minute, short, little, challenging videos. It might be from somewhere in Africa or the UK or Australia or Germany or wherever we are. Lately, we've been doing a series of devotionals that we call Secret Place Devotionals, most of which were recorded in our garden house uh, where we uh, rented apartment in Germany, so you can check those out. But it's called Missionary Advice. Adventures. We invite you to subscribe to that. So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus is speaking here and he says, All power and authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. A pretty powerful declaration by Jesus and a commissioning by Jesus. So my question for you is, is Jesus right now in 2021, is Jesus on defense or is Jesus on offense? What do you think? Huh? Mr. Don? Mr. Don Steven says offense. Does anybody agree with him? Yeah, a few people. Okay, it's good, Rodney. Thank you. A few people agree that Jesus is on offense. I'll tell you, Jesus is on offense. He is using what the devil intended for evil by closing down churches and intimidating Christians to be quiet and don't be controversial because of the last election to hold back. I'll tell you what God is doing in these last days is simply phenomenal. So Jesus is certainly on offense in the days that we're living in. You know, there was a general during World War II that was asked a question. He was asked, in war, which side wins? You would think that would be an obvious answer. His response was, the side that wins is the side that is advancing. The side that is advancing. So because of this virus, if the church chooses to play it safe and not meet, and thank you, Jake, that your doors are open and that you're meeting, because a lot of churches in Germany right now are still not open after 12 months. Our church where we live in Germany, as far as I know right now, is still not open. But the Bible says very clearly, I think it's in Hebrews, it says, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together, and all the more so as you see the Lord's return approaching. So we need to be very intentional now more than ever about how we live our lives. It's not coasting time anymore. It was never coasting time, but God's using the virus and political intrigue to shake the nations, to shake America, to shake that sleeping giant of the church to rise up and be the warrior bride that she's called to be. Amen? Come on. That's what he's calling us to do. So let's get up, let's shake off the slumber, and let's be sold out for Jesus. Our lives are a testimony It is so worth it serving Jesus. It is so worth it. You can trust the one who died for you. We have been, we've ministered in 119 nations, many of them multiple times that we've been to. Our, our ministry income has been about the same for the last 15 years. It's never fluctuated more than a couple thousand dollars. It, it blows me away. And yet we travel to more nations, invest in more Uh, more missionaries that we personally support, about six or seven missionaries that we partner with in other nations. And even though our income has been relatively relatively the same in 15 years, we're doing more than we've ever done before. That's the supernatural multiplication that comes when we say yes to Jesus. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So the picture here is not of a church in fear trying to keep Satan out. It's a picture of Satan failing to keep the church out. Again, this is not a time for weak knees and feeling intimidated. This is a time to press in more with your relationship with Jesus on a personal level. That means if you're not meeting with God daily in the morning, I say in the morning only because It's hard for me to meet with him at 11 o'clock at night because I fall asleep. So I meet with him in the morning just as Jesus got up early in the morning and met with his heavenly father during his time on earth. 
We need to be intentional about meeting Jesus regularly because he gives us the strategy for our lives, for our marriages, for our schools and and businesses that we're involved with. Be intentional. This is a picture of Satan failing to keep the church out. You shouldn't be afraid of where the devil will strike next, and a lot of Christians are. A lot of Christians are wringing their hands because they're watching way too much news right now when you need to unplug the news and plug into God's word and what he's saying. The devil should be afraid of where you and new life and the church around the world will strike next. That's where the fear needs to be, not in the church, but in the devil's camp. He should be afraid of where the church will strike next. Jesus has empowered you to move out of your comfort zone, to storm Satan's kingdom, and break through his gates and release captives. There are people that you know who are captive. They're held captive, and they're waiting for someone who will have the the boldness to speak the truth to them. This is not a time to water down the truth and sugarcoat it and put some frosting on it and hope that people might receive it. I'll tell you, the world is being fed a bill of goods that will lead them to hell. And we, who else but the church? The church is the final, is the final authority on earth that has not been taken over by evil forces, if I can be polite about that. It's the church that of those seven mountains of influence, entertainment and education and politics and etc. you have the church that has not been overrun yet. Hopefully never. Well, we read in Revelations, it won't be. But this is a time where we, we really need to be intentional about sharing the truth in love with people. Jesus said, all power, all authority and power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go. That's our assignment. It's the assignment of this church. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So the weapons that we fight with have divine power to demolish demonic strongholds. Hallelujah. So quickly, I want to give you four spiritual weapons that demolish demonic strongholds in your life in your marriage, in your family, and in your community. So write this down. The first one is the weapon of prayer. The weapon of prayer. I know some of you, the air just kind of left your your lungs at that moment. It's like, oh, prayer, here it is again. Prayer is so boring to me. I'll tell you, prayer. and there are times where it's boring to me too. And it's boring only because I'm expecting to feel something each time I pray. But part of being grown up spiritually as a follower of Jesus is that you don't feel him all the time. And I know this is a Pentecostal church, so we expect feeling a lot. And who doesn't love feelings? I'm married to a beautiful wife for 38 years. I love to feel love from her. But there's times I don't feel love. So what do I do when I don't feel love? What do you do when you don't feel love from your spouse? You love anyways. You love anyways, even when you don't feel anything that day or that week. And it's the same thing that Jesus is calling us to. If you don't feel his presence in a particular season of your life, and I've gone many, many, many months without feeling anything from the Lord, what do you do? You still press in. You still get up early in the morning. You meet with God. You read the word. You praise him. You say, God, I praise you no matter how I feel. It's not about how I feel. It's not about what I'm feeling at the moment. It's all about who you are and praising him and meeting with him and being more intentional about your walk with Jesus. Again, if you think you can coast from 2021 on, you will probably backslide and not be serving Jesus a few years from now. You need to be intentional as the day of his return is approaching. The weapon of prayer. John Wesley said, prayer is where the action is. So true. 
D.L. Moody, the great evangelist from Chicago, he said, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. I like to think of prayer as this. When you pray by yourself, it's like, it's like lighting a stick of dynamite and tossing it into the enemy's camp. And the response is, boom! It's loud, right? Something exciting happens because there is always power that's being exerted when you pray. God is always moving when you pray, no matter what you see or how you feel. God is always moving when you come into agreement with him. But the Bible says when two or more people come together, believers, in agreement, and they pray... It's a multiplied explosion that takes place. I like to think of it as, you know, the video you see on YouTube of the the Hiroshima bomb, you know, 1945. That's how multiplied, unified prayer happens. Explosive things happen. So don't neglect praying with your spouse. Don't neglect praying with your children on a daily basis. Don't neglect the prayer meetings that go on at church. You want God to move in this church? You want revival in peer? Unified prayer is the answer. I'll tell you right now, it's unified prayer is the answer for that. And that's why the politics of this virus is is to close down churches, and it is completely demonic. It must be resisted by churches, and we need to be obedient to God to meet with him as we see the day approaching. The devil's behind the virus because he's gotten pretty much what he wanted out of this virus, to keep Christians afraid and keep them from meeting together in unity because he knows that's where the power is for the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Why? Well, the answer is in James chapter 5. It says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Prayer is offensive spiritual warfare. I like to think of it as an ICBM. You know those missile silos that we used to have? I don't know if they're still out there. Maybe a few of them are hidden around somewhere. Out in West, West River here, the, the ICBMs, these missiles that can be launched and hit a target 12,000 miles away within about three feet of the intended target. All right? Well, when it makes an explosion that affects, you know, a crater that's a half a mile wide, a few feet is, is okay to be off by. But that's what prayer is. Prayer is like an intercontinental ballistic missile. And wherever you are, you can impact a people group or a nation, even if you never leave peer. And those of you that are watching by your device at home, this is something I practice regularly. I love going to Google Earth. And I'll, I'll zoom into, you know, Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Where the, where the big grand mosque is, where these Muslims by the millions come everywhere and they march around for days and they try to touch this, this rock in the grand mosque. You know what I'm doing? I zoom in on the grand mosque and I'm praying over that grand mosque in the name of Jesus. I'm praying in the spirit. Revelation, God. Bring revelation. You can, can you imagine the days we're living in now? It's not just hearing a missionary talking about some unreached people group in Papua New Guinea. You can zoom in on Google Earth to the unreached people group. You can see pictures of of mud huts as we've seen in Africa. And you can pray for those people. Isn't that phenomenal? That is the power of prayer in action. Prayer is effective. When you pray, God responds. He always responds when we pray. Angels are dispatched when we pray. Hell trembles always when you pray. That's why the devil doesn't want you to pray. And lives are always changed. Again, it's not about what you see or feel. God is always moving in the spirit. He's just looking for human beings, people who love him, who who will come into agreement with him. And that's where the explosive power is. Wow, got to take a breath after that. Praise God. God is on the move. I, I'll tell you, I don't know about you. Kathy and I, we want to get in on everything God has for us. We are, I, I feel like eternity is so tangible right now that you can, I can just reach out a foot and put my hand into eternity. It is so, the Lord's return is so close. And the end time revival, I believe it's happening right now. And why would we even consider not wanting to be in on that? 
Why are we even considering, well, I, I'm still working on my retirement. I've got, you know, pretty hefty retirement. I was talking to someone the other day, a, a friend and our, a, a family member that said, yeah, when I retire in three years, I'll have a couple million dollars saved up and then we can, you know, do whatever we want. I'm like, to me, to Kathy and I, we hear that and we say, oh, that's so boring. Are you serious? Is that what you're living for? When the most exciting thing in the world is to lead someone to Christ. And you see them in bondage and depression and you share the gospel and they begin to cry like the woman in Latvia a few years ago who said at the coffee shop, how did you know I needed to hear this? I said, we just wanted coffee. Which tells me, Pastor Jake, God drinks coffee. All right. So people are hungry for Jesus. Many times he leads us by our coffee addiction to share the gospel with people because there's a lot of coffee shop owners that don't know the Lord yet. So, I mean, I'm kind of serious about that, maybe a little bit facetiously serious, but people are hungry for God. Why wouldn't you want to get in on it? You know, it was 38 years ago, just before we got married, that we responded to an altar call at a missions convention in Minneapolis. Had no idea what we were saying yes to. It just sounded really cool. And God was pulling me out of my chair, like literally forcibly pulling me out of my chair. I, I almost could not resist. But when we arrived back in the States, it flew in a few, about five, six, six weeks ago, we had an encounter with Jesus in our truck as we're driving through Virginia or Pennsylvania. And he was saying, let's revisit that time in 1982 when you said yes to me. Are you still willing to do this? Like sell it all? Not care about retirement, which is not even in the word of God. The concept is not in the word of God, retirement. Are you willing, Dan and Kathy, still at your age, 57, Kathy, I'm 57. Um, <laughs> and we had an encounter with Jesus. We had a going to the altar at a missions convention in our truck about three weeks ago where we said, God, we will do, go wherever you want, wherever you want us to go. I don't care where we die. I don't care what country we live, we're living in. We just want to see people saved because we are so close to the end, the consummation of this whole thing. That I'm looking forward to Jesus saying, when I stand before him, <sighs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you, Dan. Yeah, I'm so proud of you. Who wouldn't want that? Instead, he says, instead, I, instead he might say to some of us, ah, well, you know, I know, I know you love me, and that's great, and hey, come on in. This is all for you, but you really wasted so much of your life. There was so much I had for you, but I had to pass on to somebody else. We don't want that. The weapon of praise is the second spiritual weapon. Praise goes hand in hand with prayer. We choose to praise God for his leadership over our lives because he is full of love and goodness and mercy. Throughout the Bible, we're exhorted to praise God continually because the reason we do this thing with this wonderful worship team, and you guys are amazing. I love your talent. Thank you for sharing your talent with us. Isn't, isn't the worship team wonderful, right? Yeah, yeah, clap, 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 clap. Okay, that's enough. All right, so the reason, the reason we do this at the beginning of a service, is be, and the reason we do it first, is because praise, worship, tenderizes our hearts so that we can encounter Jesus on a deeper way. But also, when we praise God together in unity, there is an explosive energy that takes place where strongholds of Satan in your life and in the community are pushed back. That's how powerful praise is. The devil trembles and feel the tre the devil trembles and flees from us when we fill the atmosphere with praise. And so that's why when people say to me, "But Dan, I just don't feel like praising God." <laughs> that's when I just want to reach across and slap that wonderful person. <laughs> Because that's such an immature... Now, I expect that response maybe from somebody who's not saved. Or may, maybe, maybe from a, a baby in Jesus, a brand new believer, maybe. But they're so excited about Jesus, I wouldn't expect it from them. To say, I don't feel like praising God today, it has zero. It has nothing to do with what you feel. It has everything to do with who he is. He's worthy. So you praise him. You praise him. If someone famous came in here, you know, some whoever your political persuasion is and whatever, they came in, you'd probably stand up, clap, whatever, you know, try to touch them maybe or something or get their... We would respond in some way, and yet with Jesus half the time, we're like... <laughs> yeah. 
And that's what we're doing. When we praise God, there is a, there's a spiritual energy that takes place that pushes Satan back, tenderizes our hearts so we can encounter the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in a deeper way. Second Chronicles chapter 20, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, the story of Jehoshaphat. That's a long, can you imagine naming your kid Jehoshaphat? Wow. Jehoshaphat, he's got three enemy armies that are coming against Israel to destroy the Jewish race. How many times has that happened throughout history and God has protected them? And they come against Jehoshaphat. He inquires of God what to do and God comes up with this amazing idea. He says, take your worship team, put it in front of the army, send them out against the enemy, see what I'm going to do. And we read in verses 21 and 22, it says, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord or give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And they began to sing and praise the Lord. And he set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Sur who were invading Judah and they were defeated. I love this story because it teaches all of us a simple spiritual lesson that if we want to grow up in Jesus, we better, we better grasp it. And the lesson is this, it's easy to praise God after the victory comes. And you read on in that, in that scripture, that's what happened. After the victory, they went to the temple, they shouted and praised God for days, feasted, had a wonderful time. That's human nature. That's the easy thing to do when the thousand dollar check comes in your mail and it's like unexpectedly, woo! <laughs> Thank you, Lord. That you should give thanks. That is praise to God for how he provided for you. But if you want to be a grown-up Christian with grown-up pants on, little boys and little girls, then you need to praise God, and I need to praise God before the $1,000 check comes in the mail, before the deliverance comes, before the good report comes regarding some physical ailment I I might have, before there's a victory with your child who might be experiencing rebellion, like with our kids. We had some kids that went through rebellion. God gave us a word for them. We stood on that word and we said, we do not see them how they are right now. We choose to see them how they will be. And we choose to praise you, God, for how they will be in the name of Jesus. And so we stood on that. And Kathy and I, every night we prayed for our kids. I said, thank you, God, that you're doing this in their lives. God, I thank you that they will be men and women of God. And you know what? Today, they're men and women of God. You have to stand on the word of God because that will position God to do a great work in your life before the answer comes. You have to praise him now before you see the response and the victory later because it will come. Praise positions you for victory. Praise causes confusion in the enemy's camp. And praise establishes God's reign and authority while at the same time taking ground from Satan. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Okay, got to go quick. The fourth one is the weapon of preaching the word. Reinhard Bonnke said, when I have traveled to these remote cultures. He's a, he was a missionary to Africa. He says, sometimes I, I feel the impression that the satanic infrastructure in that culture has never been challenged. Satan has often exercised total dominion over the people through sickness, drought, insanity, fear, superstition, and idolatry. But he said, when I preach the gospel, I can feel these curses break. The light of the gospel shines into the darkness and overcomes it. To preach simply means to proclaim. So that should just erase from your mind that it's something that only Jake does or some of the other pastoral staff. We are all called to proclaim, and we have a very simple message that God's given us. It's a message to tell people the good news. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing the good news And people hear the good news when someone tells them about Christ. That's our responsibility. The world is not going to be won by pastors. The world is going to be won by the body of Christ. That All of us together, we've all got to get in on this. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.16, he said, telling the good news is my duty. It's something I must do and how terrible it will be for me if I do not tell the good news. Again, people are hungry. We see it since we've been in Pierre for the last week. I think we've passed out, I don't know, a few hundred gospel tracts. We've personally shared the gospel with maybe 40 people, 
40 people in the last week since we've been here, something like that, prayed with different people. People are hungry for God. We have not had a single bad experience. Everyone is hungry for Jesus. Why wouldn't we want to seize this opportunity? The Bible says in Romans 1 verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is powerful because the gospel penetrates. People are hungry for this message. And very quickly, the fourth weapon is the weapon of testimony. Testimony. Leonard Ravenhill, famous evangelist from England years ago, he said, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Don't be intimidated about talking to people about Jesus. When you have a testimony, when you have an experience with Jesus, and a testimony simply means someone who shares what they have seen and heard and experienced. That's all you are as followers of Jesus. You are people who have experienced Jesus. You have seen what he has done in your life and in other people's lives. You've heard stories and testimonies. You've experienced him. You've seen him work in people's lives, and you just share what you've seen and heard and experienced. That's all it is. That's how easy it is to testify. And that's why you can talk to a, you can talk to a, a, a university professor who's an atheist like on God's Not Dead. You know that bad guy? You know, the, the atheist teacher guy, you know, who got saved at the end. You can talk to people like that and not be intimidated by them. They can run intellectual arguments all around you, but all you just say is, you know, this is what he did in my life. You can't refute it. Jesus changed my life. This is how I was, and this is how I am. Try to refute it. You can't. And that's why testimony is such a powerful weapon. The Roman Empire that was cruel and pagan 2,000 years ago, you want to know how that thing crumbled? It crumbled because you had the disciples, you had believers being scattered from Jerusalem, going throughout the then known world, sharing the gospel. Hundreds of thousands of people come to Christ, and you have this multiplication effect of people getting saved, coming to Jesus, going from being idolaters and pagans and immorality to walking with Jesus, and they're free on the inside. And you had people that wanted to hear that. They had an irrefutable testimony of what they had seen and heard, and it shook down the devil's kingdom and the pagan Roman Empire. That's what happened, and that's what God fully intends to do in these last days. Right now, right now, right now. Jesus is coming back. His return is imminent. Don't, don't let it slide anymore. This is not a time to slumber and slide. This is a time to say, yes, Jesus. And so would you bow your heads with me right now? I want to close in prayer. And I want to just say, Holy Spirit, we thank you for this blessing of being uh, a convicted. Lord, convicted of our own lethargy, our own sin, our secret sins, the things that are holding us back, the, how we've so embraced the American dream to say, well, I can't do that because I'm so comfortable here. Lord, forgive us for loving comfort more than loving your will for our lives, which is the ultimate comfort, being in the center of God's will. So, Lord, right now, we lay everything down, family, retirements, agendas, jobs, relationships, money, stuff, stuff that we've accumulated. God, we want to live the rest of our lives with an open hand, with an open hand. God, it's all yours. I give it to you. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, or you're watching on your device, you've never given your life to Christ, or you've fallen away from him, you're not right with him. Now's the time to simply say, Jesus, I'm home. I want to get in on what you're doing. I don't want to slide anymore. Jesus, come and live powerfully in my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use me any way you want at this time. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Dan. Today, as we kind of just bring our service to a close, here's what I want to encourage you with. There's so many things that can happen to us in our lives, so many things that are going on around us, things that call for our attention over here, over there, you know, things we can invest our lives into, things that are good things. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is that we say, Jesus, whatever it is you have for me, that's what I want for my life. And sometimes that's going to take us in directions and places we didn't expect or we're not, know, we're not really knowing what the future holds. But we know when Jesus takes us there, he's going to take us in a way that's going to transform us, that's going to make a difference in this world, and that as he promised us in John 10, that he came to give us life and life to the fullest. 
If you want to experience the best life you can possibly have, you can only find it in Jesus. So this morning, I want to challenge you, if you are a follower of Jesus, to say, what is it that I can do today to live for him more fully, to be more committed to Jesus than I've ever been before. Maybe for you, as, as uh, Dan talked today, you felt called to prayer as he talked about the weapon of prayer. Maybe, maybe there's somebody God's putting on your heart that you need to start praying for. God, use me in their life to make a difference for them, to make a difference in their life for you. Maybe as he talked about praise, you're in a time or a season of your life where things are difficult and challenging and you're not really sure what's going on. That weapon of praise is just an opportunity for you to turn your eyes to heaven and say, God, I don't know the way out of this, but I know you do. I know you hold this in your hands and I can trust in you. Maybe today you're feeling called to dig deeper into the word of God. To say, God, as you call me to make a difference in this world, I know I need to fill my heart with your word. That your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so when I hide your word in my heart, I have your guidance, your direction, your wisdom, your discernment. And when there's opportunity for me to share my faith, I know the word of God that I can share with others. Or maybe for you, the challenge is your testimony. Maybe it's time for you to be willing to tell somebody your story of how Jesus has made a difference in your life. Whatever it looks like, I can tell you this. If you pray that God would give you opportunities to be used by him to make a difference in this world, he will answer that prayer. And as we spoke about a few weeks ago, if you were with us, that scripture that says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's plenty of opportunities out in the world for us to make a difference for Jesus. We just need to be willing to say yes. And so this morning, as we close in prayer, I want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus. Whatever he's asking you to do, however he's leading you, just say yes. And if you say yes, you will experience his power and his grace in ways that you have never known before as you continue to follow him. So can we pray together? Lord Jesus, this morning, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your love, your mercy for us. We thank you, Jesus, that that we can follow you. And whatever life brings our way, God, you can help us through it. You can walk us through it. And you can use us in it. So God, help us to make ourselves available to you to say, God, use me. Use me as I pray. Use me as I worship you and I turn my eyes to you and I trust in you. Use me as I dig into your word and allow it to change me from the inside out. Use me, God, as I share my story with others about how you've made a difference in my life. God, use each one of us, those in this room, those who are watching online right now. God, we make ourselves available to you. And as we do that, God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace that's going to give us opportunities to make a difference in this world for eternity. Lord, I pray for those who are maybe in this room or watching online right now who are hearing this message that aren't committed to you yet. God, today I just pray they would sense the the gentle calling of your spirit to take the first step of saying yes to you by saying, Jesus, I need you in my life. Come and forgive me of my sin. Come in and set me free onto a new path into a new future. God, we thank you for your grace and your goodness for each one of us. Wherever we're at along the journey, I pray that you just continue your work and continue drawing us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Go on the grace of God. If you want somebody to pray with you, uh, I'd be happy to do that here. Just feel free to come on up after service here. Uh, Have a great week, and we'll see you back next Sunday.